get started. Welcome to this penultimate uh, class of uh, general relativity. Um, uh, let me just start out with a few administrative announcements. So announcements, uh, the first announcement is that even though this is the last Wednesday of the semester, this is merely the penultimate class rather than the ultimate class. Uh, the ultimate class will take place on Friday, uh, which is a Monday. So class will be on Friday, uh, the usual time and place. Uh, namely now and here. Um, second announcement. Um, so as you all know, uh, the final exam is scheduled for April 11. Um, and it is a take home exam, 24 hours. Uh, pick up uh, in my office, which is Rutherford um, 3 something, 316 uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, 24 hours, uh, you know, I, I've told you all about the exam, so we don't need to talk about it more. Uh, the one thing that I would like to mention is that if you have arranged with me to pick up the exam at some other date and time because you had some unavoidable scheduling contact, uh, please email me to let me know exactly what date and time we agreed on because I'm very bad at remembering these things. And so that way I can make sure that you get the exam when you need it. Um, uh, and all that stuff. So um, for alternate arrangements, um, presumably if you need an alternate arrangement, you've already contacted me, um, but please email again just so that I can have a master list of who is taking the exam when. Um, let's see, final announcement. So as I mentioned on the last problem set. Um, there is, I think, a colloquium not this Friday, but next Friday, which will probably be of great interest uh, to those of you thinking about general relativity. I realize it's during exam week, so as an extra inducement to get you to go, even though it's during exam week, um, I'll give you a little bit of extra credit um, for attending next week's colloqui colloquium. Um, let's see, that would be a week from Friday, which is sometime on or around April 15th, I think. Um, so it's April 15th at uh, 3.30. Um, for those of, you know, in, in the interest of fairness, for those of you who have some sort of uh, radical, uh, unavoidable scheduling conflict and can't make uh, the uh, colloquium then, uh, if you would still like access to extra credit, email me. I know there's a fluid mechanics exam at that time. So for example, if you feel unfairly biased against because you have to be an exam at that time and you want to do something else to obtain the meager amount of extra credit that you'll receive for attending the colloquium, let me know. I'll probably make you watch an online lecture on something interesting and then uh, write a paragraph about it or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, let's put it this way. The amount of extra credit you will receive is not large. Um, I haven't decided it'll be one or two points, something like that, um, out of 100 for the semester. Uh, maybe two, does that sound reasonable? Two points, uh, one, two points. Okay, two points in your final grade for going to the colloquium, um, which is probably not enough to make a difference uh, for the, most people, uh, but you won't know that at the time, so you know. Uh, okay, uh, right, because I don't have to submit the grades until midnight on the April 15th. Uh, okay, so at that point, I will have no idea what you're doing. Okay, um, let's see. Any other announcements? Any questions, concerns, thoughts, feelings? Okay, good. Let's do some physics. Um, so in the last... Uh, Two weeks, uh, having completed our study of the core basic material of general relativity, uh, we focused on two special topics, um, which are subjects of current research in the area of general relativity. Uh, the first was black holes. Uh, the second was cosmology, which we just finished up last class. And in the final two lectures, um, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about gravity waves. And um, more generally, the subject of linearized solutions of general relativity. Now, we already studied uh, the linearization of general relativity 
um, at a very rough level earlier in this course when we showed that if you have a metric which is nearly the Minkowski metric, the Einstein's equations and the formulation of the geodesics equations will, in the limit where spacetime is very close to Minkowski, uh, reduce to the usual Newtonian laws of gravitational physics. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to start by making that analysis a bit more formal and thorough so that we can study the general theory of linearized fluctuations of the metric around Minkowski space. And we will use that to conclude that there are, in fact, propagating gravitational waves, uh, just like there are propagating electromagnetic waves. Um, and then uh, next class, what we'll do is we'll describe a bit more of the physics of these gravity waves. And I'll tell you a bit about the exciting experiments that are going on, uh, which will involve the detection of these gravity waves. And also, if I have time, I'll talk a little about the production, the mechanisms by which these gravity waves are produced, um, why you can win a Nobel Prize for uh, thinking about these gravity waves in the case of uh, binary pulsar systems uh, and stuff like that. But before diving into all of those details, um, let me just remind you of something uh, that you've probably already discovered in this class, which is that solutions of Einstein's equations are hard to find. So the equations of motion, namely uh, Einstein's equations, r mu nu equals zero in vacuum, or g mu nu is eight pi g times t mu nu, are nonlinear, which makes the uh, construction of solutions, uh, exact solutions of the Einstein's equations, uh, more or less impossible. to solve unless you have some sort of symmetry present. So in the absence of symmetry, there are really only two techniques that one can use to uh, study the solutions of the equations of motion of general relativity. Uh, one is to use numerical techniques and the subject of numerical relativity is a fascinating one, and one that has really undergone a bit of a revolution in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, but it's something that I think is a bit beyond the scope of this course and is a, a, a little bit specialized. Uh, so today I will describe for you the other approximation technique, uh, the other technique that we can use to find, uh, understand the physics of solutions of general relativity, um, which is to use an approximation technique. So, in general, solutions can only be studied uh, approximately. And so, today, the approximation that I would like to consider in our study of certain solutions of Einstein's equations are... Um, is the approximation where we consider a metric which is very close to Minkowski space. So I would like to imagine a metric which is equal to the Minkowski metric plus a small perturbation. Explicitly, uh, if we were to use uh, some coordinate system such as the Minkowski coordinates, then the metric would be equal to the Minkowski metric plus a small perturbation, which I will call h mu nu. And in studying the dynamics of these small perturbations, what I will do is work only to first order in uh, this small perturbation h mu nu. So you could imagine there's some small parameter epsilon in front of h, and we're going to take our equations of motion and expand them in a Taylor series in epsilon only to linear order in epsilon. So what does that mean? Well, in particular, if you think about it, and as we'll see explicitly, it means that we're working in the approximation where the equations of motion for h mu nu are going to be linear. So uh, that means that if you solve the equations of motion that we're going to find for h mu nu, then you can add one solution of those equations to another solution, and you'll get a third solution. 
So in this approximation, where we only keep the linear terms in the equations of motion, the equations of motion are linear. That's the definition of this approximation. And so you can write down uh, gravity wave solutions, for example, and superimpose them on top of each other. So in this approximation, um, the theory is linear. And we can superimpose, or I guess superpose is also probably a word, solutions. Now that, of course, is only an artifact of the fact that we're working at linear order in the small perturbation. And so if one were, consider, were to consider higher order terms in the equations of motion, so-called nonlinear effects, this would describe some complicated interactions between gravity waves. Um, which would reflect the fact that the theory is secretly nonlinear, and so these nonlinearities will be important, um, but may uh, have lead to effects that are very small if the fluctuation about flat space is sufficiently small uh, in a notion that we could make precise later. But in particular, the fact is, is that if we're working only to linear order around Minkowski space, then h mu nu can be regarded as a symmetric 0, 2 tensor living in Minkowski space. So just like in electromagnetism, we have a theory, a field theory, whose basic dynamical variable is a 0, 1 tensor, uh, namely a differential form, which is the electromagnetic potential. Uh, the theory of linearized gravity fluctuations is a theory whose basic degree of freedom is a 0, 2 tensor. And so the theory of linearized metric perturbations is very similar in spirit, and indeed quite similar in some of the details, uh, to the theory of electromagnetism. It's only approximation to general relativity, of course, but in this approximation, many of the things that you know and love about electromagnetism will also apply to the theory of uh, linearized metric perturbations. And that is the theory that I would like to start working out today and probably will not finish until sometime uh, on Friday. So the metric is the Minkowski metric plus a uh, small perturbation h mu nu, which is regarded as a 0, 2 tensor living in Minkowski space. And because I wish to regard this h mu nu as a tensor living in Minkowski space, what I would like to do for the rest of this lecture and next lecture is instead of raising and lowering indices with respect to the metric g mu nu, I will raise and lower indices using h mu nu, using uh, eta mu nu, the metric in Minkowski space, rather than g mu nu. Why is that kosher? Well, that's a reasonable thing to do because h mu nu and g mu nu differ by a term which is of order h. So if you're working only to leading order in h, then uh, this is a legitimate approximation. So um, if we use this notation, then it's rather easy, for example, to work out the Christoffel symbols and uh, the Riemann tensor, and hence uh, Einstein's equations. Yes? Um, we will discuss exactly what sort of sources will be responsible for H B nu. Uh, loosely speaking, you should think of the analogy with electromagnetism. So what sort of sources are responsible for electromagnetic waves? Anytime you have a charge and that charge moves, it produces an electromagnetic wave. Okay, the same is now true in gravity. Anytime you have a mass and that mass moves, then that produces a gravitational wave. 
So, for example, when stars collapse into neutron stars, some order one fraction of the energy of the star is emitted in gravitational waves. Um, it might not be order one, it might be of order 10% or 1%, but some sizable fraction of the energy of the star collapsing will be emitted in gravitational waves. The most famous uh, source of gravity waves that people have studied, in fact, are binary pulsar systems, uh, where you have two pulsars, two neutron stars, which are rotating around one another, um, and so they're emitting gravitational waves, just like they're emitting electromagnetic waves. So, you know, some, or, you know if you have... Um, some complicated stellar collapse, for example, some order one fraction of the energy is emitted by electromagnetic waves, and some order one fraction of the energy is emitted by gravitational waves. Um, when we work out the equations of motion, um, as I'll do so uh, in the next few minutes, um, you'll see uh, explicitly how it is that moving sources uh, can lead to the production of, uh, electro of gravitational waves. Question? The, the class has to be asymmetric, right? Yes, we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, in fact, even though you might not realize that I've already taught you in the course in the lectures on black holes, why it is that you can't have a perfectly spherically symmetric collapsing star? Okay, if you think about it, you might realize why it is that's impossible in general relativity. But we'll review that in a, uh, probably next lecture. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, why is it so hard to detect rather re relative to an electromagnetic wave? Um, I'll discuss that also. Okay. More, there's, in fact, a very easy reason to understand why it is so hard to detect. We'll discuss that. Um, well, one reason why it's... Okay. We'll, we'll get to that when the time comes. Okay. Um... So we could now go ahead and work out, for example, the Christoffel symbols. So what is this? This is one half times the inverse metric, uh, G upper mu nu. But deleting order in H, uh, this is only, e this is equal to the inverse of the Minkowski metric because uh, G upper mu nu is equal to eta mu nu minus H mu nu. Sorry, uh, H mu plus terms which will be uh, linear in H. So, to leading order in H, the only terms that will appear in the Christoffel symbol will be one half eta mu nu times various terms that involve derivatives of H. So, there will be an H mu lambda nu plus an H mu lambda mu minus h mu nu lambda. And then one can go ahead and compute, for example, the Riemann tensor. So this Riemann tensor is the sum of two terms, uh, the first of which will involve the derivatives of the Christoffel symbols, and the second of which will involve the Christoffel symbol squared. Now, if I'm only working to linear order in H, the Christoffel symbol is linear in H, so Christoffel squared is quadratic in H, so can be neglected. And moreover, in writing out the metric terms here, um, I've only used eta rather than the correction term uh, involving H because I'm only working to linear order in H. And so what you get for the Riemann tensor is a linear combination of four terms, all of which involve the second derivatives of the linearized perturbation H mu nu. So I've skipped a couple steps here. All I've done is I've taken this equation, plugged it in here, and canceled a couple terms to arrive at this expression for the Riemann tensor. Now, uh, the reason why I've skipped a few steps is that, in fact, we've done this identical computation before 
If you remember, when we worked in Riemann normal coordinates and we worked out the, the Riemann tensor and Riemann normal coordinates, we found explicitly that uh, the Riemann tensor could be written as a sum of four terms, all of which involved second derivatives of the metric. And in fact, the computation that we're doing here is identical to that computation. So I'll just go ahead and skip uh, those steps um, and trust that you remember uh, that derivation. If you don't, it's a fairly straightforward exercise uh, to compute the Riemann tensor uh, just by plugging in and working to leading order in H. You know, uh, this expression is um, sort of obviously essentially the only thing that you could have possibly gotten because the Riemann tensor has to be uh, second order in the small perturbation. It has to have uh, all lower indices and it has to respect all of the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. So, for example, it has to be anti-symmetric in the interchange of mu and nu, which, as you can see, interchanges the first and last terms in this expression, and also uh, anti-symmetric in the interchange of rho and sigma, as well as symmetric in the interchange of mu nu with rho sigma. So, from here, it's then a straightforward exercise to compute uh, the Ricci tensor and the Einstein tensor. So in order to make our life a little simpler um, and the equations that we get a little simpler, I'll define a quantity H, which is the trace of the small perturbation H mu nu, because many of the equations will... Uh, take a simpler form when written in terms of H. And then it's a straightforward exercise to compute the um, Ricci tensor. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we just trace together the first and the third indices of the Riemann tensor, Oops, left out a few terms. So when you trace together the first and the third terms in the Riemann tensor, so here I'm relabeling uh, mu, I'm relabeling the sigma, so I'm tracing together the mu and the rho indices and I'm calling that sigma index mu again to write down an expression for r mu nu. And then we get the sum of four terms Uh, so, for example, um, this first term, when we trace together the mu and the rho index, we contract uh, one of the indices of H with one of the derivative indices to get this term. Sorry. Um, likewise, uh, with this guy, with this guy, you just get the trace, uh, the derivative of the trace of the metric perturbation, which I called H. And then finally, with this guy, you're contracting together uh, the two derivative indices to get this term. And finally, we can work out the Ricci scalar by tracing together the mu and the nu indices. So when you do that, the first two terms are equal. And what do you get? You get, uh, if I've done everything correctly, H mu nu, comma mu nu. And the next two, the last two terms also uh, are the same when you trace the mu and nu indices together. You get H, comma mu mu, which is just uh, the usual Laplacian acting on the trace of the linearized perturbation H. And finally, we can go ahead and work out the Einstein tensor, which is uh, the linear combination of the um, Ricci and uh, metric tensors. Um, it's sort of a long expression. Well, okay. There it is. Okay, and then you plug in these two expressions 
in order to write it out explicitly. Okay, and you get some not particularly illuminating looking combination of six terms that are linear in H. Yes, question. Is that the Yeah, well, what I'm doing here is I'm using uh, the rule where I raise indices with respect to mu and nu. So, for example, when I write down this expression, what do I mean? I mean the trace of H, the second derivative, and then I contract those two derivatives with eta mu nu. Or, of course, that's the same as d mu, d mu of H. Namely, it's the usual Laplacian that you would write down, minus dt squared plus dx squared. I guess you would call that the de Lambertian, acting on the scalar function, which is h, which is the trace of the linearized perturbation. Is that clear? Any questions? I've gone through this a little quickly because this is just uh, some straightforward uh, manipulation of the sort that we've seen before. Um, and I don't want to dwell uh, on too many of the details here. Any questions? So this expression that I have written down here for the Einstein tensor um, is a little bit uh, tedious. And so the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to introduce a notational simplicity, which will allow us um, to write this a bit more compactly. So what I'll do is I'll introduce something that I'll call H bar, which is also a symmetric two tensor, which is just H mu nu minus one half H times eta mu nu. And uh, this is a linear combination of H and eta mu nu, and it is sometimes referred to as the trace reversed uh, h mu nu. So you've probably sometimes seen things like trace subtracted uh, tensors, where you subtract off, you take the linear combination of a matrix and the identity matrix, such that the trace of that linear combination is zero. This is not the trace subtracted, but in fact the trace reversed. Uh, why is it called the trace reversed? Well, if I defined H bar to be the trace of the symmetric two tensor H bar, what is that? That's H, the trace of H mu nu, minus H times one half times the trace of eta mu nu, which is four, so that's minus h. So I've just defined the linear combination of h and eta mu nu such that the trace of h bar is minus the trace of h. Why have I done that? Well, I've done that because you can then see that this uh, trace subtraction here is identical to the combination of r mu nu and g mu nu, uh, of r mu nu and eta mu nu, that I used to define the Einstein tensor. So if I wanted to write out the Einstein tensor in terms of h bar instead of h, it's just given by the Riemann tensor, sorry, by the Ricci tensor, where I replace h by h bar. So that means that the expression for the Einstein tensor is a little bit simpler when we write it in terms of h bar rather than h. And I have written it out for you here. So um, this is then a relatively simple expression for the Einstein tensor 
working to linear order in H. So, in order to determine the linearized perturbations, which are sourced by a uh, matter configuration given by a stress tensor T mu nu, we will need to solve Einstein's equations, which say that G mu nu is equal to 8 pi G T mu nu. And here, in order to remind ourselves that we're working to linearized order, this will be G mu nu uh, at linearized order. Yes. You're, you're that I, I, I made a mistake when I said something earlier. In fact, uh, it's not exactly given by replacing H by H bar and R mu nu. You need to actually be a little more careful. If that's what you're asking about. Yeah. I, made a, I, I, I misspoke uh, earlier. So in order to work out this expression for the linearized Einstein tensor, uh, just go ahead and plug in in this expression and work it out in terms of H bar, and you'll find what I've written here. I've skipped a skip. I've skipped a step here because you know uh, I'm nothing if not lazy, and uh, it's not a it's not particularly uh, illuminating to go through all of the steps uh, where you cancel various terms uh, in the linearized Einstein tensor against one another in order to obtain the expression that I have written here. So do you all believe that you could do that computation? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, good. That's because uh, I don't know what I was writing down there. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, good. Okay, any other questions? Hopefully I got that right. So what does this mean? Um, just to step back a little bit. So let's imagine that we have a metric which is very close to flat. Say the metric in this room. And I would like to calculate the amount, the, the gravity, uh, the perturbation to the metric which is produced by my mouth flapping up and down as I give this lecture. So I write down the stress tensor that describes my mouth opening and closing as I deliver this lecture. I plug this in to the equation of motion that I have written here, and I view the stress tensor describing my mouth flapping open and closed as a source term on the right-hand side of this equation, which will act as a source for the linearized perturbations of the metric on the left-hand side of this equation. And at this level, morally speaking, this is nothing uh, too different from what you have studied in your classes on electromagnetic waves, where you had a source term on the right-hand side, uh, which in that case would have been a current rather than a stress tensor. And you would determine the electromagnetic waves produced by that current, which might describe some moving charged particles, by solving Maxwell's equations in the presence of a source. And here, because we are working at linearized order, the, right, the left-hand side of this equation is linear in the metric perturbation. And so we can go ahead and solve this equation uh, by working in using some method of Green's functions uh, in order to determine the electromagnetic, the, the gravitational radiation, just as we did in the case of electromagnetism. So, um, what I would like to do now is work that out um, a little bit more explicitly. Um, but at this point, uh, morally, it should be clear that what we're doing is no more or no less difficult than what one does in electromagnetism. The equations are a little bit more complicated. Although, as we'll see uh, in uh, a few minutes, they actually uh, are not any more complicated. But at this point, the equations look a little bit more complicated. Um, but at the conceptual level, there's nothing particularly difficult about what needs to be done here. But an important point 
And the point which I really want to emphasize is that even without sources, on the right-hand side of this equation, this is a non-trivial second-order uh, differential equation um, for h mu nu, which has non-zero solutions. And these solutions are known as gravity waves. Namely, they are propagating perturbations of the Minkowski metric, uh, which can be thought of to a large extent as being exactly analogous to electromagnetic waves. And these waves will solve the differential equation g mu nu working at linear order is set equal to zero. I would like to make one point here, which is that there is in fact a completely different route that we could have taken in order to derive the equations of motion for h mu nu as I have written them. Which is that we can view h mu nu as a field just like the electromagnetic field living in flat Minkowski space. And its equations of motion, just like the equations of motion of the electromagnetic field, can be derived from an action. Now, what is the action that will lead to the equations of motion that we have written down for h mu nu? Well, this action is, of course, just the usual action of general relativity. So the usual Einstein-Hilbert action. But because we're working only to linear order in the equations of motion, it's the Einstein action which is expanded to the lowest non-trivial order. Uh, in particular, it's the action expanded damn it, to order h squared. So if you took the Einstein-Hilbert action and you plugged in the flat Minkowski metric, of course you would just get zero. But if you took a metric which was very close to the flat Minkowski space, and you started expanding the Einstein-Hilbert action order by order in this small perturbation, you would find that the term linear in H would vanish, and the first non-trivial term would be second order in H, and so you would find an action which is quadratic in H. That's good. Actions are always quadratic in their field variables. And the equations of motion for H are found by writing down the Euler-Lagrange equations obtained by minimizing that action with respect to H so that the functional derivative of S with respect to H is equal to zero. That would give you some linearized equations of motion, which would be precisely the Einstein tensor at linear order that we've written down above. Any questions on that? Um, I think that's a nice exercise to go through. Um, Actually, expanding the Einstein action to quadratic order in H is uh, somewhat more tedious than the exercise that we went through above. So I only wrote down for you above the Ricci scalar expanded to linear order in H. If you wanted to go through this exercise, you would need to expand it to quadratic order in H. Um, that's a straightforward um, but rather tedious prospect, so I won't go through it here. Are there any questions on this, however? Uh, the idea, hopefully, uh, is reasonably clear. So here's a quiz for all of you. So I told you that if you expand the Einstein action uh, order by order in H, the term linear in H vanishes. Can anyone tell me why? Yes. Nope. 
That's correct. So if you view the expansion, the, if you take the action and you plug in the metric of Minkowski space plus a linearized perturbation, then what is that? Well, that's the Taylor expansion. We just Taylor expand around Minkowski space. So it's um, the action of Minkowski space, which of course is zero since the curvature of Minkowski space vanishes. And then by Taylor's theorem, the first term in this perturbation is the variational derivative with respect to the metric evaluated in Minkowski space uh, times the small perturbation, h mu nu. And that, of course, vanishes because the der derivative of s with respect to the metric is the equation of motion. Okay. So this is equal to zero. So the term linear in h will vanish. And then you'll have something that's of order h squared. And so this is a general principle that you should keep in mind. Whenever you have a solution to the equations of motion, um, the action will vanish at linear order by definition because those are the equations of motion, which means that the small fluctuations can be found by expanding that action to quadratic order in a small fluctuation. In mechanics, this is a standard thing to do whenever you study the motion around some equilibrium solution. You find that motion by expanding the equations of motion to linear order or the action to quadratic order around an equilibrium solution. Now, in order to understand the solutions of the linearized Einstein's equations, um, I would like to not immediately dive in to the solutions of these equations, but I would like to first think for a few minutes about the symmetries that are present in the theory of gravity when we work to linearized order around Minkowski space. So the first thing that I would like to emphasize is that in general relativity, our theory has a lot of symmetries. The symmetries that we have used in constructing the theory of general relativity are the symmetries under coordinate transformations. These are analogous to the symmetries under gauge transformations that we encounter when we study electromagnetism. So the theory of linearized perturbations, so the action and equations of motion of this linearized perturbation h mu nu, has a lot of symmetry. Which is analogous to the gauge symmetry of electromagnetism. It's so analogous that sometimes we just call it the gauge symmetry of gravity. In particular, um, the equations of motion and action are unchanged under a uh, coordinate transformation. So in particular, what I would like you to do is I would like you to imagine that we are doing some coordinate transformation of the metric. And in particular, I would like to imagine that we are doing an infinitesimal coordinate transformation. So how does the metric change under an infinitesimal coordinate transformation? Well, as we have learned, an infinitesimal coordinate transformation is described by a vector, say, v mu. So that's the vector which generates this coordinate transformation. And then the metric goes to the metric plus the Lie derivative of the metric with respect to this vector, which is just the covariant derivative of the vector with both indices lowered and symmetrized over mu and nu. So this is something that we derived in our discussion of uh, symmetries in the theory of curved metrics. <coughs> 
So how does this linearized perturbation H change under this coordinate transformation? Well, H will just change according to this formula by twice the covariant derivative of the vector symmetrized with its indices lowered. And if we wish to work only to linear order in H, as we are doing here, then I can freely replace that covariant derivative by a partial derivative. So then you can ask what happens to the various equations of motion that I have written down for H. And it's straightforward to check, although in fact we already know it has to be true by the invariance of the equations of motion of general relativity under coordinate transformation, that the equations of motion, say g mu nu linear is equal to zero for a gravity wave, are unchanged under this transformation. And indeed, they're unchanged for any coordinate transformation. And so in particular, they will be unchanged under this transformation for any choice of vector, v mu. So just to summarize, uh, we have h mu nu, which we view as a symmetric 0, 2 tensor living in Minkowski space. And in fact, the equations of motion are unchanged if we do the following. We choose an arbitrary vector v in Minkowski space. We take h to h plus the derivative of v, appropriately symmetrized, and lowered. And then it turns out that our expression for g linear is completely unchanged when we do this. And in fact, so is our expression for the Riemann tensor. Why is that? The Riemann tensor is a physical quantity. It tells you about the curvature of space-time, and it doesn't care whether uh, what coordinate system you're working in. This is straightforward enough to check explicitly. So let's just go up and see how that works. Well, you could imagine taking this formula that I've written here for the Riemann tensor, transforming the uh, linearized perturbation H in the way that I wrote below, where H goes to H plus the derivative of a vector. And you'll get a bunch of, you'll get four extra terms involving the derivative of the vector that appear in this equation, two of which have plus signs, two of which have minus signs, and then you use the fact that the indices are symmetrized and the equality of mixed partial derivatives to check that they cancel. And in fact, this symmetry of the equations of motion under this uh, transformation is highly reminiscent of the gauge transformations of electromagnetism. In particular, I remind you that the gauge, the equations of motion of electromagnetism are expressed in terms of a field strength F, which is a two form that is the derivative, uh, the exterior derivative of the one form A. And this field strength is invariant under transformations where we replace A to A plus d phi, uh, where phi is some scalar function that can be chosen arbitrarily. So if A goes to A plus d phi, then F is left unchanged because d squared is equal to zero by the equality of mixed partial derivatives. So that says that the action and equations of motion of electromagnetism have this large gauge symmetry. And in particular, there is a large redundancy when we write our field variables in terms of the 
quantities A and the quantities H. So in particular, what does this mean? This means that the physical degrees of freedom are not given by A, are, are, are overdetermined by the potential A of electromagnetism. There are certain degrees of freedom inside the electromagnetic potential A which are not physical. These are what you would sometimes call the longitudinal polarizations, uh, uh, the, the transverse polarizations of uh, a photon. And likewise, in general relativity, there are certain degrees of freedom living inside the linearized perturbation H, which are not genuine geometric degrees of freedom of space-time, but they only reflect the fact that um, H contains in it also some things which depend on your choice of coordinate. What does this mean from a practical point of view? What this means is that we can use this so-called gauge invariance to put the linearized metric perturbation H mu nu in a form where the equations of motion are relatively simple. Did you guys do this in your class on electromagnetic waves? Did you use gauge invariance to put the equations of motion of electromagnetism in a relatively simple form? You didn't. I'm seeing some notes. Okay, well, you're going to learn how to do it for gravity. Oops, Jesus. Are there any questions? So just to reiterate, when we formulate the dynamics of electromagnetism by thinking of the electromagnetic potential as the basic degree uh, of freedom of electromagnetism, we're actually being a bit too generous. And in fact, the physical degrees of freedom of electromagnetism do not include all of the degrees of freedom contained in the electromagnetic potential. For example, an overall shift of the electromagnetic potential is not a physical degree of freedom. Likewise, in gravity, when we pack it, when we describe the degrees of freedom of the linearized perturbations of space-time in terms of a symmetric 0, 2 tensor H mu nu, we are in fact being uh, over-determining our physical, we're over-counting the number of physical degrees of freedom because some of those degrees of freedom can be removed by a judicious choice of coordinates. So what I would now like to do is use a choice of coordinates, a clever choice of coordinates, to put the linearized perturbation H in a form which will make it easy to handle. Um, in particular, um, this process is known as making a gauge choice. And in particular, the choice that I will make is uh, what is known as Lorentz gauge. So I will choose my vector v mu such that the linearized perturbation H Uh, is in what is known as Lorentz gauge, which means that it obeys the equation d mu h bar mu nu is equal to zero. So at this point, it should not at all be obvious to you that I can choose my vector v so that I can always take d mu h bar mu nu equals to zero. So I would now like to demonstrate to you how this is possible. Before I do this, are there any questions? <laughs> 
So you guys did not do gauge fixing or gauge choices in your electromagnetism class? A little bit, but you might not have understood them <coughs> based on the looks that I'm getting. Okay, don't worry, you'll understand them now. So how can we do this? Well, how does the linearized metric perturbation change under a uh, coordinate transformation? Well, this is what I wrote down above. H mu goes to H mu nu plus the uh, symmetrized partial derivative of V nu for some vector V. Now, I'm imposing a gauge condition on the trace subtracted uh, metric perturbation. So I need to understand how the trace of H transforms. So H will go to H plus twice the trace of that uh, symmetric combination d mu v nu, which is just the divergence d mu v nu, right? Because uh, when we take the trace, uh, we contract with a symmetric tensor. So I just get 2 times d mu v nu. So I remind you that d mu v nu is equal to 1 half d mu v nu plus d nu v mu. So those two terms are, of course, equal when you trace by contracting with eta upper mu nu. So h bar mu nu, which is the trace reversed metric perturbation. So that's the linear combination of h mu nu with minus one half h. So that will go to h bar mu nu plus twice the derivative of v nu coming from this first term. And then we have to subtract one half the transformation of h. So it's minus one half a to mu nu times, let's call it d alpha v alpha. So I don't reuse my mu index. So that's how h mu nu transforms. So then let's look at the quantity that I'm trying to set equal to zero. And let's ask how that guy transforms under a gauge transformation. So d mu h bar mu nu will then go to d bar h bar mu nu. Plus, we just need to um, write this all out explicitly. So there's d mu d mu v nu plus d mu d nu v mu minus uh, the derivative of this guy, which is d nu d alpha v alpha. And if I relabel in these last two terms, if I relabel alpha to mu and use the equality of mixed partial derivatives, these two guys will cancel. So under a gauge transformation, the quantity d mu h bar mu nu just picks up this term here, which is d mu v nu. d mu d mu v nu. The de Lambertian or the Laplacian acting on v nu. Okay, so how then does this gauge fixing procedure work? So let's imagine that you hand me some symmetric two tensor h mu nu. So given an initial h mu nu and hence h bar mu nu, we simply uh, compute d bar h mu nu and we choose a vector v mu such that d mu d mu v nu is equal to minus d mu h bar mu nu. So that under h mu going to h mu nu plus 
twice. Uh, so just under this gauge transformation, uh, d mu h bar mu nu will go to zero. And the only remaining question then is whether it is always possible to choose a vector so that this differential equation, which I have written in a box here, is satisfied. And the point is the following. Let's stare at this differential equation. This is a differential equation for V in terms of H. And what does it say? It says that the D'Alembertian operator or the Laplacian operator acting on V is equal to some source term in terms of H. And one thing that you hopefully learned in your electromagnetism class is how to solve equations of the sort where the D'Alembertian acting on some function is equal to some other function. This is the basic equation of motion of electromagnetism. And the point is that it can always be solved. Why? Because uh, the D'Alembertian is, uh, if you want to use a fancy language, an invertible differential operator so one can use the method of Green's functions, for example, to always find a solution of this equation. So the equation box always has a solution since this D'Alembertian operator is invertible. So for example, if you wanted to solve this differential equation, um, you could use, for example, the method of Green's functions. You know, you just solve this differential equation not with a complicated source on the right-hand side, but just a delta function source on the right-hand side. And then, because it's a linear equation for V, uh, you find the full solution by integrating that up over uh, the entire source that appears on the right-hand side. The nice thing about this procedure, however, is that we never actually do this. We simply declare that we have used our freedom under coordinate transformations to set uh, a gauge where d mu h bar mu nu is equal to zero. So, we can freely set d mu h bar mu nu to be equal to zero. Are there any questions on that? There's a very similar thing that one does in electromagnetism, also known, confusingly enough, as Lorentz gauge. Uh, where one uses these gauge transformations to set d mu a mu equals to zero. Damn it. <coughs> and in that gauge, the equations of motion of electromagnetism become particularly simple. There is one final point that I should make, however, which is that we have not completely exhausted our freedom to make gauge transformations. Sorry, there's an R there. That's, free. That's the word freedom. Um, why have we not completely exhausted our uh, ability to make gauge transformations? Well, in particular, 
we could still make a gauge transformation. which obeys grad mu the de Lambertian acting on V is equal to zero. And then this would preserve the Lorentz gauge condition. D bar uh, D of H bar mu nu is equal to zero. Because how does that guy transform under gauge transformations? It transforms by the addition of the de Lambertian acting on the vector V, which is zero. So this means is that there is still uh, some so-called residual gauge invariance left. And when we try and completely solve the equations of motion in order to count the number of degrees of freedom of a gravitational wave, we will impose some further conditions will, which will completely use up our freedom to choose a vector v obeying this condition. So this remaining gauge invariance can be used to simplify uh, h mu nu even further. When I work out explicitly the form for gravity waves uh, in a certain coordinate system, I will use this residual coordinate invariance. But the first thing that I would like to do is just show you how simple the equations of motion for a gravity gravitational perturbation look in Lorentz gauge. So in Lorentz gauge, the equations of motion for the linearized metric perturbation H say that G mu nu linearized is equal to T mu nu, 8 pi G times T mu nu. And so we then just need to go up to our expression up here for the Einstein tensor working at linear order, and we get to impose the Lorentz gauge condition, which says that whenever you have a derivative contracted with an index of h bar, you get zero. So that first term is equal to zero. That second term is equal to zero. And we are just left with the third term. Okay, maybe there's a fourth term also, but I'm going to use my residual gauge transformation uh, in a few minutes to get rid of that fourth term. Um, okay. I see that I was a little sloppy when I wrote up my notes. So uh, what is the equation of motion? We had an H bar mu nu. a second derivative thereof, plus a second term, what was that, minus h bar mu nu, h bar, is equal to t mu nu. This then is a rather simple equation to solve. So let's ignore this last term for a minute. So if you just ignored that last term, then what is this expression? This says that the de Lambertian acting on H is equal to T. So you solve this just like you solve Laplace's equation in electromagnetism. You have some de Lambertian acting on H which is equal to T, 
So you first solve that by introducing, for example, a delta function source on the right-hand side to obtain a Green's function. It's the usual Green's function for the D'Alembertian that you use when you study electromagnetic radiation. Then you integrate that up over the source in order to uh, obtain uh, the full expression for the linearized metric perturbation uh, created by some source. And then the only thing that remains is to deal with this pesky term here. And uh, that is actually a rather straightforward thing to do. Uh, it's just you just subtract off the trace um, part of this method of Green's functions. Let's see. Yeah, in fact, it's clear that if you took the trace of this equation, um, you could ob obtain an analogous uh, equation where you just have the Laplacian acting on the trace of H, and then uh, that would be equal to the trace of T. So you're solving, so the equations of motion are reduced to an equation of the form de Lambertian acting on H is equal to a source. And these are easily solved, just like in electromagnetism. Are there any questions? I hope I didn't make a mistake in my notes. Hang on, let me just take a look here. I hope I didn't lie to you. I think I might have lied to you. Unfortunately, I really don't like the discussion of uh, gravity waves in the textbook. So I wrote my, so I wrote this, I did this without the help of the textbook when I was preparing my lecture. So I think I might have had an equation wrong up above. I think this term here might be minus eta mu nu h comma h, uh, let's call it alpha beta, comma alpha beta. Bar. I don't think this has worked out in the, I don't know if it's worked out in the text actually. I think I might have done this myself. But I'm worried that I lied to you. Okay, I'm gonna have to, we're almost done with lecture, the class. So I'm gonna have to work that out myself and see uh, what I get. I think I might have made a mistake when I uh, wrote the lecture notes because I think what you're supposed to get has no term like this here. Okay, I apologize for that. Well, yeah, I could always get rid of it. Okay, let's put it this way. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, uh, redo the computation and take a look. The reason why I was a little sloppy is that uh, an approximate, by the end of the next page, I'm going to use a gauge choice where I set that equal to zero anyway. Um, so I think what I might have done is made my gauge choice earlier on in the computation than I have in my lecture notes. So I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to check up on whether or not it's zero. Um, to some extent, however, I don't care whether or not it's zero. Because the next thing that I would like to do is focus on what the solutions look like away from sources. Namely, where t mu nu is equal to zero. So that we set the right-hand side of this equation equal to zero. And then, as we described, both of these two terms must separately be equal to zero. Because if we take the trace of this equation, it just says that h bar comma mu nu is equal to zero. And so uh, even if we're 
using a gauge where that term has not yet been set equal to zero. It's set equal to zero by the equations of motion. And so the equations of motion become a Laplacian or a Gilambertian acting on h bar mu nu is equal to zero. Or if we wish to use um, Cartesian coordinates minus dt squared plus grad squared, the spatial derivative acting on h mu nu bar is equal to zero. So what are the solutions to this equation? Well, the solutions to this equation are plane waves just like an electromagnetism. And what I would like to do next class is work out explicitly what these solutions look like um, and describe to you what it would look like physically if we have a gravitational wave which passes by. So given that I only have two minutes left in class, I'm not going to try and do that here. I think it would take just a little bit longer. Um, so perhaps I should stop here and see if there are any questions. Yes. Did you? We have not yet used the residual gauge. Um, what's that? Yes. So there, what I will do next class is introduce what's known as transverse traceless gauge where I will use up the remaining degrees of freedom in the gauge transformations to completely uh, fix, uh, well, I will set uh, the trace of h equal to zero in particular, um, which means, which is why I was a little sloppy in my notes about whether or not there was this term in the equations. I apologize for that. Okay. I think this is, I've gone most of the semester without making any serious errors in my notes. So, you know, uh, all good things must come to an end. Uh, are there any other questions, though? Uh, I'll look up what the answer is, and I'll let you know. Any questions? It might be in the textbook. I sort of, I remember when I read the discussion in the textbook, I was unhappy with all of his various gauge choices, and so I, I, I decided I would write my own damn lecture, and, you know, there's always dangers in that. Any questions? Do you want a chalkboard lecture on Friday? I would. I imagine that, let's see, how many people are here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I imagine the other 15 people that registered for the class who are not here might appreciate a, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a recorded lecture. How many people would prefer a chalkboard lecture? Do you guys prefer chalkboard lectures? How many people would prefer a tablet lecture? Okay. What was it, three versus four with ten abstentions? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, I am perfectly happy uh, to give Blackboard lectures, you know. Do you guys like, okay, well, it's a little late at this point for me to be changing my lecture style with only one class left. How about this? Why don't we, I only, my discussion of gravity waves will only take a few minutes. Okay, I only... I have about 30 minutes left of lecture material for this course and approximately 70 minutes of lecture. So I'll find something fun to do for the last 40 minutes of class, which will not be recorded. It will be Blackboard only. Um, it'll be very, very exciting. Okay. Uh, okay, see you guys on Friday.